Well, I'm going to speak to you about something again. I wish someone had explained to me in my younger years, especially in ministry, and especially in ministry in a charismatic, Pentecostal kind of church. Your church and our church would fall into that tribe. Most days we're happy to be in that tribe. Some days, not so much. Some of our times our Pentecostal charismatic tradition has not served as well. And I think in this area too especially. Where this came to me from, the idea to speak to people about this came to me from recently, I was invited to speak at a corporate event in London at a wealth management company in London. And uh, I do speak at corporate events too. And so they asked me to speak on the title was Life Without Limits. And it was the picture, the, the, the media they had for the event was the picture of a man planting a flag on the top of Mount Everest. Life without limits sounds cool, sounds trendy, sounds exciting, sounds look good on a t-shirt, life without limits. Only problem is there's no such thing as life without limits. So the, so the news I had to break to them was, well, I can come and I'll speak at your event, but if I speak on that title, I'm going to have to redefine it. I'm going to have to explain to the people at the conference that there is no such thing but explain why I think we believe that that's true, but why it is impossible to be true, and I'll reframe it and speak about that if you like. And I said, I love your, I love your media, the man planting a flag on top of Everest, but if you take a pygmy and put him on top of Everest, he's no taller. It's just a small person on top of a big thing. And I have realized building church all my life that you should never put small people in charge of big things. I've got into a lot of trouble doing that. And small people are people usually that are emotionally expensive. Just look straight at me right now, all of you. Some of you are like, he's talking about you. Are you here? So I'm going to speak to you about my reframing of that idea. And my version of that is going to be called the gift of limitation. The gift of limitation. I try to work hard on my titles. A good title is one that you remember years later, like, like a song or a book or a movie. A good title is one that when you remember the title, the content of the message instantly comes back to your recall. A bad title is one that doesn't do that to you, like faith. What are you teaching on, Pastor? Faith. Oh, okay. And people have been in the meeting, they say, what did he speak about? What did she speak about? Faith. Oh, okay. What about faith? Uh, I don't know, but it was great. <laughs> and in my communication masterclass, which Donovan mentioned, one of the things I teach is that your freshness as a communicator, the freshness of what we say is never in the topic. It's never in the subject because there's nothing new to say, really, unless you dig for it, about David and Goliath. It's always going to be David. It's always going to be Goliath. It's always going to be Moses that crossed the Red Sea. It's always the same players. So if we're going to teach you from these same scriptures that we've taught for hundreds of years, we better find an angle. The freshness is in the angle, not in the topic, but in the angle you find within the topic. So this is an angle within the idea of limitation. And I believe limitation is a gift. And I want you to leave tonight with three takeaways to go home with. First of all, I want to reframe your thinking about limitation, as I just said, and see it as a gift. Because accepting the limitations that you can't change, and we all have them, limits you, if you like, or frees you, or pushes you towards the limitations that you can change. Secondly, I want you to know the difference between limitations of design and limitations of of default. A limitation of design is why laptops don't make toast. But we don't send the laptop back as useless because we know it was never created to make toast. Some of you were never created to make toast. I'm using it as a metaphor now because some of you really can't make toast, can you? And it's a big issue in your relationship. But I didn't mean that, so stay with me. It's a metaphor. And then I want you to finally 
understand if we have time what I think is the greatest secret limitation of all that nobody tells about, most people don't know about, but we should if we want to understand the nature of limitation. The first time I became aware, I suppose institutionally, of the curse and tyranny of limitation, I suppose, in the way that it was put to me, was at school at 15 when I went to see the careers advisor. And he said to me, and I went to a school where, you know, the thick, stupid kids went, is how it, that was the feel. I failed my exams at 11. We all had exams in our country at 11 years of age. On the basis of the results that day, your following six years of education went one of three ways. Grammar school for the kids that passed the test, the smart kids. Technical school for the kids that kind of did average in the test. Those that failed went to secondary school, comprehensive schools. They became known as eventually, well, that's where I went. So when the careers advisor sat me down at 15 and said to me, kind of one after the other, we sit down. He said to me, what do you want to do for a job? And I said to him, I want to be a fighter pilot. And he laughed at me like, you get real. That is not an option for you. That's an option for the grammar school kids, but not for people that come to this school. So he laughed in a way that I knew he didn't take me serious. So he said, no, no. He said, I'm serious. What, what, what do you want to do? What would, you, what would be your ideal job? I said, I told you, I want to be a fighter pilot. So realizing that I wouldn't let go of this fantasy, in his opinion, he said to me, well, let me ask you, what does your dad do? What does your dad do? Meaning, whatever your dad does is what I think you should think about doing because this was the day and age of apprenticeships. And so if my dad had a certain job, I knew he would say to me next, well, maybe your dad could get you an apprenticeship. What does your dad do? So he said to me, what does your dad do? So I said to him, my dad is a serial killer. <laughs> I did. I should have known then I was destined to be a rebel and a revolutionary. I said, my dad's a serial killer. He said, what? Excuse me? What did you say? I wanted to say that to him so he couldn't say to me, perhaps he can get you an apprenticeship. I wanted to shortcut the script. I wanted to take the script off him and tear it up and throw him. Of course, he just saw me as rude and as out of control and tried to fix me. But I realized at 15 years of age that the system was stacked against me. That the system, and some of you are in a system, and if you're at school, you're in a massive education system. The education system in this country, and in our country, and in generally westernized education systems, is killing our kids. Every parent in here, more than ever, you have to get involved in, 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 in nurturing your kids, because schools are killing them. Schools are obsessed with tests and exams that tell you nothing about your child. What we're interested in is the flourishing of people. It's a big passion of my life to invest in people so that they can flourish because I believe we have a crisis of human flourishing all around the world because natural resources are buried deep in the ground and they're very complicated and expensive to reach. So are human resources. The best parts of you your particular genius and brilliance is way below the surface. And if no one helps you to figure it out, if you're not in cultures like this church, where our culture is geared towards championing your potential, towards helping you get out your brilliance, because school won't help you do it. So we have to find other places where we get around people that are not going to say to us, what does your dad do, and stop you there. As if that's the limitation of your life, what does your dad do. So I realized early on that I must not accept, nor must you, these imposed limitations that are put on us by where you were born, the color of your skin, your socioeconomic background, the education system, the system of the country that you're in, apartheid that this country came out of, was an institutionalized, limiting, non-believing in people's potential system. And thank God that that is over, but it's still not over in many people's mentalities. We've still got a long way to go, as we have in America with the whole black, white race issues there, because I also have a home in America, spend a lot of time there. So 
as I got into my late teens, early 20s, I had an epiphanal, uh, defining, life-changing experience around about 20 years of age. I call, it, I call it the yellow that triggered the green. The yellow that triggered the green. Now, I got married when I was 16, and by the age of 20, I had three kids. I know. I told you I was 95. <laughs> I have been married now for 45 years and have four children. And our first daughter, uh, Charlotte, who herself is in ministry all around the world, and Charlotte and her husband now pastor the church that I handed over to them in 2012. Um, she was born when I was 16. She wasn't planned, you know what I'm talking about. She was five months old before we got married. Most people caught, date, get engaged, get married. We just bypassed all that stuff and just had a kid. <laughs> then my wife and I had twins. I know. People go, ah, oh, fantastic. No, 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 come in, let me talk to you a little bit. Because I didn't sleep for three years. So by the time I'm 20, I've got three kids. I'm living in a, a council house, a, a government-owned house, you might call it, the projects they call them in America, and it had a bright yellow front door because in the council houses, the government houses, this was how it worked. This is how the painting scheme went. Blue, green, yellow. Blue, green, yellow. And the house you moved into was forever that color. You couldn't paint it any other color. You couldn't, you couldn't mess with it. It was government-controlled, government-policed, government-backed-up color scheme. And so if you moved into a yellow house and thought, oh, you know what, I'll just change that, you realize then you can't. All the woodwork, all the, all the front door, the, the, the frames, the glass frames were all painted. And I'm talking bright canary yellow. That yellow there, that's the only picture I could find. I couldn't find the picture of my house, but it's kind of like that. So blue, green, yellow. So, so we were yellow. And I was about 20, and I had three kids, and we were broke. And I was in a job that I hated, but I had to kiss that frog to pay the bills because we had three kids, and, and we were not doing well, and we were struggling in our relationship and fighting and arguing all the time because we just were so young and so stressed out and didn't have any help, and I just felt so, I felt such a failure in not being able to change that, not lifting us out of that, and you know, I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. One of the books I wrote was called I Am Not My Father, as, as, as a commentary about that situation with my dad, um, but I remember feeling about 20, I am a total repeat of my dad, that I would not want to be him. I don't want to repeat his life, but I'm kind of defaulting to becoming like my dad because I feel powerless, which my dad felt all his life. I have no money. My dad didn't all his life. I resent my life, and my dad resented his life all of his life, and we grew up around that moodiness and that aggression, which became violence and drinking in him. And I thought, I can see the beginnings here of me becoming a repeat of my dad. And, and, and one morning, I opened the curtains to, to get up and, you know, start the feeding routine and then set off to walk to work. I worked in a carpet factory and I was going to set off to work. I opened the curtains and there's a guy on a ladder painting my house bright yellow. A council workman, a government employed painter, painting my house yellow. I opened the curtains, he did the worst thing or the best thing he could have done. I opened the curtains and he went, <laughs> winked at me like, good morning, I'm painting your house, I'm doing you a favor, aren't you glad I'm painting your house? But it had a different effect in me. It woke up the Incredible Hulk in me. The passive Dr. David Banner version of me that had been going along with this life I didn't like, that morning something happened. You, you've all had and will have moments like this. Sometimes you can't see them coming. Sometimes the way they arrive is a bit odd, a bit weird. It's hard to explain to someone. Something just happens. You see something, feel something, experience something, and something just goes off inside you. What you've got to do then is not calm down. Last thing some of you need to do is calm down. 
You've been too calmed down for a long time. What we need, what we need you to find is this person inside of you because everybody has one. Every single one of us has the equivalent of an incredible Hulk, angry, I'm done with this, I won't have this anymore person in us. And mine had gone to sleep. And that morning, the council painter, painter woke up the incredible Hulk in me. And I turned to my wife and I said, right, that's it. I'm done with this. The guy's paint. I don't even have the power to determine the color of my own house. Never mind, do I want it painting today? It's yellow. It's been yellow for years. And the man winked at me. How rude. How cheeky. He winked at me. I said to my wife, and I'm ranting as she is feeding the babies. And I'm ranting about the painter. And she said to me, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of this crummy job. I'm going to get a job that pays me more money. And I'm going to start saving. We're going to buy our own house. So she said to me, go ahead and make my day. <laughs> so I was so angry and I kept that anger alive in me. And I went out and started to look for a job. And I thought I'm going to get a job in keeping with my strengths. I talked about that so with you strengthening. I hadn't figured out by then what all my strengths were, but I knew I could talk. The gift of the gab, some people call it. So I thought, you know what? I'll get a job selling stuff. My idea being, if I can get a job selling stuff as a salesman, I'll get a car as well. And we'll have transport because we had no transport. We were in the church that I pastored for 30 years, but we didn't live in the city. We were getting three buses every Sunday morning with our kids, taking them to church every Sunday morning for years, and we didn't have a car. So the idea of a car that was provided with a job to me was an ideal scenario. So I went, long story short, I got a job as a salesman. I started saving for the first two or three years, and I saved up enough money to but to get a deposit on a house, to get a mortgage, to buy a house. And I was the first Scanlon ever, the first Scanlon ever to own our own house. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, no big deal to people that have always owned their house, but, but it was, it was precedent setting. It was, it was barrier breaking in our family as is some of the things that you have and you will go on to do in your life. And, and for me to buy our own house and to take my little family to our own house, I don't remember in the first week, I painted my front door. I'll tell you now, it was not yellow. And so this has to happen, I think, in some shape or form in life for all of us. And it needs to happen for us corporately and organizationally and politically, and in so many ways we need the equivalent of something like the yellow that triggers the green, something in your life that makes you feel, okay, I, I'm done with this, I, I'm, I'm so done with this, and it wakes up this other part of you that has been passive for too long. This is how we begin to figure out the difference between limits of design and limits of default. Let me speak to you about limits of design and limits of default so that you can understand the gift of one and the non-gift of the other. Limits of design is stuff that you were born with. So the physiology, the DNA, the biology, the limitations that God gave you. So you're never going to be Beyonce. And you have to accept that. You're never going to be Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran or Mo Farah or whatever figure you aspire to. You have to accept these God-given limitations. If you can accept the limitations by design, you were designed not to be able to do that stuff. It then frees you do not waste your time trying to make a limitation of design into a strength because you can't do it. And we wish, we wish people would tell that to these people that go on Africa's Got Talent or whatever you call that show here. 
these talent shows, where these kids get on stage and they interview their friends and parents before they get up and they say, oh, she's going to blow you away. I'm telling you now, she's, he, he's unbelievable. Oh, man. And, and then, and we all know, don't we, what's coming. Then the kid gets on stage and it's a train wreck. And when the judges say what we all know, they get offended. And now the parents get offended. And they slam the door behind them, cursing the judges. That's, that's not accepting a limitation by design. And if you accept limitations by design, you will not spend seasons of your life trying to make toast when you're a laptop. Trying to be, trying to be Beyonce when you are beyond uh, doing that. <laughs> and what happened just then? It's been a long day for me. <laughs> so a limitation by design is something you were born with. And what people say to us, which is why this life without limits thing gets loose. Hey, you can be wherever you want to be. No, 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 no. That, that is bad advice to tell a child, to tell anyone. You cannot be whatever you want to be. You can only be whatever your strengths allow you to be. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. No, 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 no. If at first and second and third and fourth you don't succeed, you need to stop and check Am I trying to do something that actually I'm good at? Because people try, try, try again and, and, and don't succeed and think the answer is to try more. And you'll spend years of your life trying to get good at something that God never made you good at. Because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a limitation of design. You were built not to be able to do that. And if you can figure out what those are, then you are free to focus on limitations of default. Limitations of default are the things that you should not accept in life. The things that society, that the careers teacher put on me. Limitations of where you came from, your background. As I said, the color of your skin or a system that's stacked against you or some identity that you shouldn't have accepted or anything in life that says to you, you can't do this and you should question it and lean against it and push it. Limitations of default are up for grabs. Limitations of default and the all over our society, all over our society and relationships are the ones you should say, I don't think that's true about me. I don't accept that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to settle into just becoming that person. I'm, I'm going to push that a little bit. I'm going to see whether or not I can actually change that. I'm going to see whether I can go for that. These are limitations by default. Default means, and this is the danger of default, default is like autopilot on your life. So you kind of don't know it's happening. You just bob along for years accepting that that's not an option for you. Accepting that you'll never be any good at that. Accepting that you shouldn't really aspire to that. People like you really don't aspire to that. And, and, and default is this autopilot going along in life, accepting this stuff. And what you have to do with, with limitations of default is you have to take manual control of your life. You have to take, you have to take your life off autopilot setting and grab the controls for yourself. And start flying your life manually. Start saying, I refuse to accept this about me that my family and friends, and sometimes family and friends are the worst at putting default limitations on us. Because they can't see you any different to how they've always known you. And you must never ever be loyal to an old version of yourself. You, you can't do that. That's a default setting. Ah, it's just the way I am. It's just the way he is. Just the way we are. We kind of always been like that. Yeah, hello. Then maybe you need, maybe you need a yellow to awaken your green for you to break that containment because millions and millions and millions of us live our lives in these containments that we don't know we have because it's a limitation not that God chose, not a design one, you can't change those. 
but it's a default one. And we think that, we think that they're the same because people tell us, ah, oh, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never be able to do that. I don't think that's possible. I don't think that can happen in a place like this, a town like that, a country like this. And we think that that is somehow a limitation of design. So we leave it alone. It's a default one. You have to figure out the difference and then start to push against the ones that you should not lie down under. Y'all okay? I know that some of you are lacking a few Bible verses tonight to make you feel this is kosher and from Jesus. But you'll be okay. I want to mention in this last few minutes what I think is the greatest secret limitation of all. The greatest secret limitation of all. It was worth coming just for this tonight. And the, sec the greatest secret limitation of all is what I would call our belief systems. Our belief systems. Belief systems are, are something I'm fascinated by. And I've studied psychology for about 15 years now because I wanted to understand people better than I did because people can be interesting, weird, strange, random, complicated, scary. And I wanted to understand people. I think anybody that works with people at least owes it to yourself and them to try and figure people out because most people are too lazy to figure themselves out. So I thought, I better figure themselves out for me so that I am not all the time dealing with weird stuff that I can't explain and I get discouraged and fed up and think I'll change my job. Because you've got to figure people out. So psychologists teach us that belief systems are the hard wiring of what you believe. Problem is that the belief systems are established by the age of eight. So whether you grow up to be a stingy person or a generous person is decided by the age of eight. Whether you grow up to be a risk taker or a play it safe person is decided by the age of eight. Whether you grow up to be a forgiving person or a person that holds grudges and you don't forgive is decided by the age of eight. These belief systems that are embedded into us in the most formative season of our life, childhood. Because kids don't learn like you're learning now. Not in your head, taking a note. Kids just learn by monkey see, monkey do, don't they? Kids just pick stuff up. And you say to kids, where did you get that from? And the answer is, from you. And because you don't remember telling them to behave that way, you don't think you're responsible for it. But kids don't learn by telling them this is what to do or not to do. Kids learn by example and by atmosphere and by the default autopilot mode of the home they're in. So you can tell the kids all day, you, I, could do a, I could do a lecture in here on mumps and do a brilliant multimedia presentation on mumps. You'd have a notepad filled. You'd be a genius on mumps. But if I've come in here with measles, you leave here with measles knowing everything about mumps. Because people catch who you are. People catch what you have, not what you say you have or what you say they should have. And this is how kids pick up and people pick up default mode beliefs. So these belief systems we all came into this room with tonight. And these things were decided way upstream of where you are now. And now you're not eight. Maybe now you're 38 or 48. All you know is, I've got stuff in my life that I don't even like about myself and I don't know what to call it. I just feel threatened in certain situations or I feel insecure around people or I'm, I'm cynical all the time. I always have to sort of bring someone down a peg or two. I always have to have the last comment or, or I, I'm a very nervous person or I'm kind of... Um, overconfident and I kind of over talk and overshare the oversharing thing overshare and there's these fault lines in our lives and it's cost you jobs and it's cost you friendships cost you opportunities but we don't know what to call it and usually they are these default mode belief systems that we don't know that we had for instance three million plus 
Hebrews came out of Egypt, but they died in the wilderness not because they were slaves physically, but because they were slaves mentally. So they had a slave mentality. They had a victim mentality because oppression breeds victimization. Oppression breeds victim mentality. And your country knows a whole lot about that. So do other parts of the world. So these, these generationally established slaves couldn't get over the fact that they were free and so still behaved like slaves though they were free and it was that belief system that cost them getting to the promised land. So this is how real this is. These things can be life or death and no one tells us, that's why it's a secret, no one tells us that these, that these socio-economic, cultural, regional, racial, gender, whatever they may be, belief systems are deeply embedded in our lives and because, um, because we have two minds, we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. We all know that. What we don't know is the ratio. The ratio is that our conscious mind is only 20% of our thought life. 80% of your thought life is subconscious. How scary is that? 80% of where your thinking comes from is below your consciousness. It's where your beliefs sit. And those beliefs are controlling all outcomes. This is why you can go to the gym in January. You know that New Year's resolution stuff? I'm going to get fit, lose a few pounds. Go to the gym in January. And by February, March at a stretch, you're going less often or not at all. Or the treadmill someone bought you for Christmas so that you can work out at home. You were on it religiously, dedicatedly, every single day until about 1st of Feb. And by the end of Feb, you just use it to hang your clothes on. <laughs> because your 20% head said, this is good. I'm going to do this. But you didn't know and no one told you that your belief system sat there saying, no freaking way are we doing this <laughs> and what you don't realize is this and what we don't realize is this with this issue you cannot have a behavioral change without a belief change it will not sustain but we try to change things by behavioral modification all the time never realizing that we default back to the wrong behavior because what's feeding the wrong behavior is these deeply subconscious belief systems. And these belief systems are controlling all of the outcomes in all of our lives here tonight. This has been good for me as a leader and a pastor because it makes me more realistic about what's possible in a service like this. My expectations have totally changed on what's possible in me talking to you for 30 minutes. I kind of downgraded years ago what I believe was possible. You'll never hear me saying ever, I stopped this years ago, hey, I've got to tell you, this is going to change your life tonight because that's overpromising, and I don't decide that. You decide that. So when people say, in a, when I'm in a meeting and people say, I've got to tell you, this will change your life, I say to myself, I'll be the judge of that because you will and I will. I might say something to you and say, guys, this is really, really important, but I don't hear what happens next, which is what goes on inside your head because there's two voices in this room there's what I am saying to you then there's what you are saying to you about what I'm saying to you and what you say to you is by far the most powerful voice in your life let's get the band back up here I should have said that some moments ago when you say that gives people hope we finished <laughs> seriously I've been in some meetings where I wish to God the band would have got up sooner. <laughs> From a life flashing before me on the third hour. <laughs> Thank God for these kind of churches where we realize people have lives outside of the church and families and jobs and stuff. So the band can come back up now. Thank you. When you don't say, can the band come back up and the get up, it's like their way of saying, okay, get off. So, we all have here tonight, you've all come 
with these subterranean, subconscious, default belief systems. I don't know what they are for you. J.K. Rowling that wrote Harry Potter was interviewed on TV a while back and she's now multi-multi millionaire worth hundreds of millions, married two kids. And she was telling the story about she was trying to write the seventh edition of Harry Potter but her house was chaos with the kids and school run and school pickup and family around and staff in the home and she was behind on the deadline and panicking and a friend said to her, Joe, you should go and rent a hotel suite, buy a flipping hotel, go and buy, rent a space and go and write there. Don't try and write at home. Go and buy a space, rent a space and go and write there. Then come home and be mum and then go back and write in the hotel. Go and rent a hotel room, rent a hotel suite. And, and G.K. Rowling said to a friend, but that would be such a waste of money, so expensive. To which your friend went, you didn't just say that to me, did you? You didn't. We get to say that, not you. And when, when J.K. Rowling said, I heard myself say, but that would be so expensive, he said, it's only, she said, it's only then I realized that the broke single parent that wrote the first Harry Potter in a coffee shop in Edinburgh where she went to keep warm because she couldn't heat her flat when she drank two coffees a day because she couldn't afford more than two. And she would sip it slowly so the owner didn't throw her out. And she would sit for the warmth in the coffee shop, typing the first ever Harry Potter. She said, it's then I realized, when my friend said that to me, she said, it's then I realized that the broke single parent version of me had not caught up with the multimillionaire version of me. That's a belief system that locks you and anchors you in an old mindset, even though your whole surroundings now say that all that should have changed. So this is the greatest secret that keeps people limited. These belief systems that prevent you progressing even though you want to and you know you can and you should and you do the equivalent of going to the gym, the equivalent of trying to improve yourself and you default back all the time to the person you don't want to be. The chances are you have a belief system and the only way to change it is you have to reprogram that subconscious jukebox. Got to put new tunes in there and it's hard work. It's hard work personally and corporately and a lot of people quit because it's so hard work and the longer you leave it the tougher it is. But I got to tell you those belief systems are where your default limitations are coming from. And we've got to identify them, find a language for them. At least if you go home tonight saying, I wonder what would be my belief system? Ask your friends, what would you say would be possibly one of mine? Can you help me get in the neighborhood even of where I might have an internal default limitation that's just stopping me progressing? Because you know what your natural ones are. They're easier to spot maybe. These default ones are tricky. And so I'm just shining a light on them in the hope that it may become aware to you that you have one or two or three that you can identify I tell you if you can change just one of those for the rest of this year if you can work on one and reprogram one belief system it will completely seriously it will completely release your life to a whole new level and give you a lot of more options that you don't have right now because you don't know what it is that's holding you back because you want to change you want to do that and you try but you keep being dragged back it's probably a belief system that's limiting your life and that's one of the best kept secret the devil has but it's not a secret anymore because I just told you amen come on let's stand together all across the room well father we thank you so much for this amazing idea that you had at the beginning to use us to use ordinary people to represent you in the earth and we feel privileged to have met you that you even glanced in our direction still is amazing to us let alone that you would include us and use us and believe in us and get stuff done through us and so we are here tonight always in awe of your grace and your inclusion of us and I just pray tonight for everyone here, those listening later to 
the download online that you will help us to get intentional about this issue of limitation. Help us to figure out our default mode limitations. Help us to find the courage and the wisdom to identify and to navigate our way through the complexity of this limitation issue. And I pray for change and progress and upgrades and breakthroughs for us as we become aware of our self-limiting default modes and the green, as it were, wakes up inside us. And I pray for an enough is enough moments for us in these weeks and months ahead as we start to tackle and change things that we shouldn't have been living with for as long as we have. And we thank you for your divine assistance, help, partnership, belief in us as we attempt massive things in our lives that people tell us we can't do and our forefathers never beat. But on our watch, in our time and our turn, we are committed to not default to our ancestors, our forefathers, helplessness, victim mentality, fear, insecurity, small-mindedness. Lord, we refuse that. Every generation has to make a choice about these things. We choose to step up and to stand out and to speak up and to take manual control of our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Let me ask all across the room while eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and you've never ever given your life to Jesus who gave his life to you 2,000 years ago, so this moment isn't about God making his mind up about you. That happened way back. This is down to you now. Never given your life to Jesus. I wonder, would you want to do that tonight? Is this the right time and the right moment for you? Maybe you once prayed a prayer, lifted a hand and prayed a prayer, but you weren't ready. You did it to keep someone else happy. That happens a lot. Did it for your spouse. Did it to keep your friends happy because you thought, if I don't lift my hand, it's a deal breaker. So tonight I want you to listen too because this is about you, for you, deciding for you, not for anyone else, that I, I want to make this decision. I want to make this stand tonight. God, I, I, I give you my life. I want a new beginning. I'm stepping up and I'm stepping out. Come on. If that's you tonight, will you lift your hand where you are? When I've seen your hand, you can take it down. And you're just saying, yeah, that's absolutely me tonight. Come on, someone here, someone over there. Come on, over there, over there. Fantastic. Come on, who else? Just keep lifting your hands. Someone there, down here, there, there. Fantastic. Anyone else? Just lift your hand where you are. Come on, anyone else? Someone there, over there, over there. Fantastic. Everybody look at me a minute. Let me just say, listen. Lifting a hand is only one way to come to Christ. It's not the only way. If lifting a hand doesn't suit you, then don't lift your hand. Don't let our methods stop you. Find whatever way works for you. We don't care how people come to Christ. We just care that you do, and we care that our methods don't stop you. So listen, if you're not offended that we ask you to lift a hand, we're not offended that you don't. It's a win-win. But those that did lift a hand tonight, we honor you, we celebrate you, we thank you because it's a tough thing to do sometimes. But if you're in your heart thinking, I would like to do that, but I would like to do it in a different way, we don't care. Find someone, speak to someone. But let today be the day where you do the equivalent of that somehow in your life is what this moment is all about. I'm going to say let's give a huge applause to the ones that did lift a hand. I'm going to hand back to Pastor Donovan. Thanks everybody for having me. Go strong. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you.